Ще е укрепира. Sir, uh, would you turn to Ephesians 6, verse 11? Here was a pool of water, and the kids were playing in the pool. And the mom came up and dipped her toe in the pool. <laughs> it's cold, it's cold. You know how cold water is. You know, you don't want But here are kids, toddlers, three, four, five-year-olds. They don't care about cold, apparently. They can just... Take that, I can't take it. So, you're dipping your toe into it, and you're thinking, I'm not sure, I'm slowly going to get into it. Now, another scenario. The child has just fell into the pool. Are you going to care how cold the water is? No. You're going to plunge into that water, unafraid of the cold, because you want to save that child's life. <coughs> that is evangelism. You don't care what people think. You don't care what it feels like. You just do it at your own cost. You're willing to pay any cost to save that child's life. That was just a quick evangelism moment because I'm going to take a break from that series on hell to talk about spiritual attacks because they are coming, friends. We are growing. I got a letter from a prisoner who said, I cannot wait to come to the Brethren Church and, and I'm bringing God with me. And at the end he goes, tell my, our family I'm coming. You hear what he just said? Yes. He's never been here. He doesn't know any of you. Yet he has that open heart, that humility. Willing. He says, it's our family. I thought that was awesome. And so he's growing and, he, and he's doing a lot of things. I've admonished him. I've encouraged him. I've corrected him where he needed it, just like God does me. And Dave Powell, my mentor, the retired <laughs> pastor, mentors me with a few blows. And I need it. Because, so here's kind of the interesting thing is... Uh, he is now experiencing more spiritual attacks from non-believers in the church. And he goes, I can't understand that. I go, that's good. You want to be under spiritual warfare and attacks for persecution from others because it shows you you're doing the right thing. You know, I like Paul's explanation. This is, if I was not preaching the gospel, why would they be persecuting me? I'm paraphrasing that. So Ephesians 6, verse 11 and 12. And I'm going to go basically, uh, base the message on this because... It's getting ready to happen. I've already got some spiritual attacks. I'm, I'm sure some of you have. Uh, it's coming. Why is it coming? I'll tell you why and what it looks like, what it feels like. And it's really powerful. These, these wicked spirits are more real than what we actually see with our eyes. Uh, just because we can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So in Ephesians 6, verse 11, put on. Again, we talked about that in Sunday school. Put it on. It doesn't slide in. You know, God's not going to put it on for you. You've got to put it on. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles is a scheme, schematic, uh, planning, uh, subterfuge. Uh, he's got plans to try to destroy our testimony and discourage us so we're not going to witness to other people. But we have weapons, spiritual weapons, to fight back. The fact is, in Ephesians 6, verse 12, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against powers or rulers, principalities, uh, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. The, the, the word for spiritual wickedness, the literal Greek says wicked spirits. They are spirits, they're demonic, and they want to destroy the church. They want to bring as many people to hell as they can because they know their fate is sealed. So, 
We're wrestling against the powers of darkness in high places, places of authority, in the Supreme Court, in, in Congress, in powers, uh, uh, worldly powers, and in trying to unify a one world government that's going to that's going to fit perfectly into the plan of Satan to either either for us or against us. Christ says we are for him or against him. So, and I'll explain what that what I mean by that in just a little bit. I've seen an image one time on Facebook that it really disgusted me, and it's got Jesus and Satan arm wrestling. And okay, go Jesus, I'm for you. That is so unbiblical. That's not what it's talking about wrestling against. Jesus has defeated him. He, he, he was a prince of uh, darkness has been judged and at that hour at the cross. Even though he had not gone to the cross, he had already been judged because Jesus knew it was, it was coming. So think of it this way. Long time ago, and this is what godlessness will do to the country and what it can do to us. During the, just before the Bolshevik Revolution, before communism swept into Russia and, and, the, and that area, that vast expanse, the Bolsheviks were plotting and, and trying to determine how we're going to throw, overthrow the emperor, or uh, the czar, I should say. And so they were planning and plotting. You know what the bishops and the church and the Christians were doing at that time? The Bolsheviks were just down the street arguing, debating, ranting against each other, raging against each other, arguing over whether we should use 18-inch candles or 22-inch candles. How sad! The nation is falling and they're arguing about the length of candles. So that's a tactic of Satan. He will destroy a church by, by division, uh, by trying to destroy uh, the unity. And that, that is one of his tactics. What will happen was the result, an atheistic, godless nation that killed more people otherwise, more than Stalin, I mean Stalin and Lenin both, more than Hitler ever did. And the only thing that approaches it is our, is our abortion of Roe v. Wade, over 65 million babies. So we've got, it's like I heard one guy say, this is the new Sodom and Gomerica because we are destroying so many lives. So the point is, he can get into high places and, and rule nations. He is the God of this world. But I want to give you some tactics of, of abilities. For the first place I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you about is how, how in the world do they attack? How would they, uh, who do demons attack? Why do they attack? Some Christians that are, what I've said, pew potatoes, are interested in getting the holy huddles and, and staying within, you know, now they're saved and they're seated and they're sealed and, they're, and they sit. Instead of going, like we reach out, some of us reach out to others for the lost. So he's not going to mess with those. He's going to look at those that are stepping into enemy territory. Uh, those that are, in, in fact, this week we've had another church go in Korea to join us because they don't really have certain places in, the, in Korea that you don't have open churches. They have, believe it or not, they might have smartphones all collectively or they might have one in the whole group watching. I know that sounds crazy, but that's the only way that they can worship God. And so I'm glad they're here. They, they are already under the do, uh, dominion of that ungodly nation, the prince of the power of the air. Now, I'll give you an example. These demons are uh, opposed to anything about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to do anything to prevent others from being saved. In one case, Daniel, I remember Daniel prayed to God, and it took three weeks for that prayer to reach Daniel. And I, I, I wondered, there's no hint that Daniel says, well, I guess God's not hearing me, I'll give up. No, he kept praying and praying. And then when, here's what happened in Daniel 10, 13. Uh, you don't have to turn there if you don't all read it. And this is the ESV version. The angel told Daniel why it took him three weeks. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, that's three weeks. But Michael, thank you, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help him out. And, and for I was left there with the king of Persia. Left there, indicating that he was there. Was he able to go back? Was he freed? I don't know. I get the idea that this was either one prince or a demon over, or it may have been Satan himself. The text doesn't say, but if it took Michael, that's a pretty strong spiritual force. That's what we're fighting against. It doesn't may not see, just because we can't see it. So the prince of Persia, I believe, was a very powerful demon that controlled the government, just like he did Babylon, and he allowed uh, a, a lot of things that, it, but he's a real and present danger. 
It, and it's not an arm wrestling match. He's been pinned. It's done. He's finished. If I had a fork, I'd stick it in him. He's done. But that doesn't mean, for example, if you've defeated someone, that doesn't mean they can't get back off the mat and go for those that he can attack. And that would be us. He can't touch Jesus. And there's a Psalm 105, uh, 105 15 or 105, 5 that says, Touch not God's anointed. Amen. That's you. Amen. That's you guys. So, just like Job, uh, Job chapter 1, I can't remember the verse. You can do anything you want to, but take his life. I think that he's got an ability to do uh, a lot of uh, spiritual damage on us. And as a career, but one thing I would say, when I had four or five people contacting me one time about spiritual ex, I think they're ramping up. I think he's running out of time, knows his time is short. He's going to ramp it up, friends, I, almost yeah. for sure. So here I've got four or five different people in different parts of the globe saying, Satan is doing it, Satan is doing it. I go, I go hold on. Satan is a created being. I don't want to give him too much credit. He can't be in one place and two places or three places at the same time. So if they all reported it at the same time, I'm pretty sure that's not Satan. He is not omnipresent. He can't be at five places at once. He's a created being. More likely, these are demons, maybe ranks and orders of demons, possibly. But it, it only takes one, it took one angel of the Lord to slay. 36,000 Assyrians. So, you know, one angel's a lot to deal with. You know, so Paul says, well, I would say this, he would spend more time on presidents, uh, leaders, uh, maybe powerful evangelists. Maybe he focuses on Charles Stanley. Do you know, Dr. McGee is with him now, with the Lord now, but powerful people that are making impacts around the world. He's gonna, they're going to focus on him. I'm not going to flatter myself by thinking, oh, it's Satan. So I, I'm not saying that, that you, what you said there was wrong, but because they're under his dominion, but uh, I don't think he's going to, he's going he's to send other demons to attack us and me in particular. He's not going to waste his time. I'm kind of a little peon compared to the big men that in, who are running seminaries, who are running nations, uh, Congress and Senate and the Supreme Court. So I, I think that Paul writes in Ephesians 2, Verses 1 and 2. And this is going to explain a lot because we don't see the spiritual attacks coming. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. And again, I'm going to read out of the ESV version because of the flow. <clears throat> I remember the Shawshank Redemption where they got this big guy coming in. Uh, and he's a really nice guy. And they, they, he didn't really commit the murder. And they're trying, leading him in. Dead man walking. And, and it's so true about us. Look, Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. You were dead in trespasses, which is transgressing the law of God, and sins, which is about everything we do that's ungodly, which you once walked, past tense, we still sin, we're not sinless, we sin less, and we try not to walk in that. So, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world. You know what, you and I, we're following the prince of the power of the air. And we don't even know it. This is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience and the daughter, which we were at one time. It's like, it's like saying, blind man walking, blind and dead man walking, look out, you know, but they didn't know it. A child that is born blind doesn't know they're blind. Until they see it. And until they're old enough to understand. So, who are these prime targets of the devil? I think the Satan and the demons are right now more busy than they have to be. You know, I know when the demons were the first to acknowledge that Jesus was Christ and he was the Son of God, they got it. Nobody else did. But you know why? They knew, they said a couple things that says, Are you here before our time? So they know their fate is sealed. They know the Bible better than we do. I bet you they turn to Revelation 22 and they know. They know it better than we do. Oh, yeah. And Revelation 20, 11, that's, this, that's a bottomless pit with Satan and all those are thrown into it. They know that's coming. So when they saw Jesus, they go, oh, I thought it was a little early, Jesus. He's not time yet. So the point is that I'm trying to make is that we're fighting something more powerful than we are. Oh, you know, yes. I, I kind of worry about people that would say, uh, I rebuke you, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of, you know, Jesus has already defeated the devil. You know, we can, I'm not saying that we shouldn't resist the devil, we flee from the devil, 
And, and but that's the demons focus on those who are entering enemy territory. Uh, they hate it when we bring the gospel into the community, uh, in, into neighborhoods, into the nursing home, into prisons, wherever we go, any place that people are. He's already been there. It's like we're behind the lines, and here's Satan's territory, and we're dropping parachutes. And we're rocking behind enemy lines. And don't you think he sees that? And who's going who's gonna to focus on, you know, the, the Christians, the ones that are professing without authentic fruits of the Spirit, you know, because there's a lot of people that profess Christ, but they don't possess Christ. So there's a lot of con, uh, false converts. And uh, so he's not going to waste his time on them. One thing I noticed that, uh, the one, one thing Satan will try to attack are those who have uh, humility. If the person is full of pride, he's got nothing to do. He's going to take the weekend off. He's got no problem with that because they're already on self-destruct. And he already knows the proud are opposed to God. God is resisting them because of their pride. So demons will do this. They will attack the belief in your own salvation. Has that ever happened to you mm -hmm. where yeah. you wake up sometimes? And I've done it. I'm admitting that I've done it. I've woken up and says, God, I don't know if I'm saved or not. And it makes me fall on my face. And it makes me run to the Bible and to go maybe Romans chapter 8. And I think, hey, this is yes. true, right? Romans chapter 8 is should make you feel better. That's what I Amen. tell people. Read that chapter and see if you still feel like, you know, you've, you've lost it, your salvation. Now, I have eternal life, but I lost it. Well, if you had it, was it eternal? No. It was temporary. So Jesus says, I give it eternal life, whoever believes in him. And he says, but if you mess up, I'm going to take it back. I see none of that in the Bible. But that's what Satan's going to use. Doubt, and, and he's going to look, you're going to look in the mirror and say, God, I can't be saved. I'm a hypocrite. You know, I, I'm a sinner. And, and he's right. He is the accuser. The devil means diabolist. It's accuser. Slanderer. <coughs> Satan means that he's accusing us day and night. And you know what? He's right. But he's already forgot. Case dismissed. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he who knew no sin, and I knew a lot of sin, became the righteousness of God through him. So he who knew no sin became the righteousness of God. So that, that God looked at us, he's going to see us. Because we put on Christ. Again, the, temper, the idea is putting on Christ. And what you put on Christ, God doesn't see us. Are sinful. He sees Christ, the righteousness of Christ. Another sad fact is I've had a lot more of this persecution from other Christians over non essential in the faith. They're talking about, for, you know, one guy said I could, he could raise the dead. And I said, the first mistake is you can't raise anybody. You can't even raise your toe without God's help. You can't raise the dead. God decides who raises the dead. Well, I have the gift of healing. It says, well, then that's, that's possible. God will have the, you know, heal some. But, you know, you're not healing anybody. It's all God. So he may want us to take credit. The guy, I believe, was full of pride. I've raised people from the dead. I, I, I. He is the new I am. So that's one way he will try to take certain beliefs and non-essential beliefs like tongues, you know, all these other issues. It doesn't matter that the pre-millennium or the tribulation or I'm a millennium or I'm a millennium and I'm a pan-millennium. It's going to pan out. Don't worry about those things that are not essential. Amen. He will get us to Amen. divide over something like the color of the carpet. A huge Baptist church in Texas divided over the color of the carpet. Wow. Just like at the Bolsheviks, those bishops were arguing over the candle size. They should have been on their knees begging God to intervene for the nation. And getting outside of the church. That's how the Roman Empire was converted from within. Okay. So he will get us. In fact, some of the worst persecution I've got are from other Christians who disagreed about something that I wrote. And I says, you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with God. Because I try to stay away from the fringe stuff. Yeah. And the main things are the plain things. Okay. I'm sticking with what's plain and what's the main thing. Because nothing else matters, does it? Which, and I love this. Satan's going to get into your head and he's going to think, well, you did this and you didn't remember we did this and, and this. When Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Revelation 20, 11. Thanks for the reminder, Satan. Oh, which reminds me, here's your fate. God said it. You can't undo it. It's like the Word of God spoke. If I say a word 
Here's an example. If I said a word to you, can you take that word back? Can I exalt? And I can't do it. That's the effect, the power of God's word. And it, and it can't be undone. It's permanent. It abides forever. So Satan, guess what? God said this. I'm not worried about you. I, and it, more likely it's the demons that are doing that. You know, we give too much credit to Satan, and he's not that great. I would say, it's funny, in Revelation 20, 11, it talks about reminding Satan of his past and then reminding yourself of your future. So remind him of his future. Don't look back. I told Robert in, in one of the prisoners, this, we don't trip over stuff that's behind us. Do we walk backwards? Stop looking back. Look forward. Satan, Amen. that's done. That's got the blood of the Lamb covered over it. You can't touch it. I've been forgiven. And yes, I did not deserve it, but none of us did. Revelation 20, 11 here. I have conquered. I put myself in I. Put yourself in. You have conquered. But the text says we. But let's make it we. Me. You. I like to make the personal pronoun in Bible, uh, in, in Scripture where it fits. Because this is to you. This was written to you, not to me. Revelation 20, verse 11, here. I wish I could leave him a note in the morning and hear Satan have a good day here. Here's a note for you. I have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives unto death. And Satan, by the way, you're going to be cast into the bottomless pit forever and tormented there forever and ever. Have a good day. You know, I'm, I'm not really going to focus on my past I look at the, I, if I do focus on the past, I look at how much mercy God has given me over my past. Yes. I don't want to go into every detail. Some of you, I shared with you before, several years ago, I said, I'm telling you, I spilled my guts. I said, I would not want me here. I would not hire me. I'm not worthy. But the point is, none of us are. Amen. That's right. That's right. I'll tell you what, demons will make you try to feel hopeless, yeah. lost. Depression yeah. without purpose. I'm trying to help Robert find purpose. He doesn't have a purpose, yet he hasn't found it. I says, you don't, I, I'm talking to Richard because it's one of the prisoners, not this guy, but he doesn't feel like he has a purpose. If God saved you, he's got a reason to save you. Yeah. He's going to put you in the body somewhere. And Robert, I don't know where that's at, but I know it's the place. There is a place for you. The body is incomplete with all of these so he's going to make you feel stressed. How about short fuses? Man, I tell you, the last three days, I've been just like snapping. I don't have a dog to kick, but if anybody has one that can loan me, I mean, I felt like it. And my cats are so fast, they get out of the way. I'm, I'm not, I'm kidding there. But the point is, it's like a fuse is just like that. What's going on? Yeah. That's a sign that you're under spiritual attack. And you're, you're looking at the circumstances instead of what we said, give thanks in all things. Yes. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. Uh, not, not that we thank God for the bad things, but even evil is used for good. Yeah. Look at the cross. Look at Joseph. Yeah. You know, They don't have any problems, the demons, with the out, people outside there, out, out in the world. Because they're, all they're saying, they're dead, blind men walking. They're dead, blind women walking. No problem. They're headed for the cliff. I'm, I'm not going to worry. What we're attempting to do is, is like Jesus, showing there's two paths. There's two paths to take. There isn't a third path. There's not a fork in the road. There's, there's not a three-pronged fork. There's only two paths to take. And the Satan wants us to think that there are other paths by other philosophers uh, or uh, other false teachers or even Oprah Winfrey or, or Dr. Feel Real Good and whatever you want to call him, all those things. They're... they're trying to make life appear to not, there's not a narrow path. There is only one path. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13. You know, first of all, they say, well, how come there's only a few be saved and many are called a few are saved and there's only a only few Jesus? And I said, that's not the question. Why do any of us say? Why is there even a path? There shouldn't be, unless it was the path to destruction. Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. <coughs> and those who enter it are many. Only the fish that survive go upstream. The ones that 
any dead fish can float downstream. That's what these guys are doing, most of the people that are unsaved. We're going to go fishing them. We're going to go fishing to try to catch them. And, well, we're going, to, we're going to bring them to Christ, and he's going to actually do the cleaning. We don't, we've got catch fish, and then God cleans them. No, God is all in charge of all of that. He uses us as a means yep. to do that. Like inviting people to church and writing and, 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 and all of those things. So Matthew 7, 13. There's who enter in it are many. That's worrisome. For whoever in verse in verse 14, Matthew 7, 14, the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. That's kind of a warning to me that not everybody that lives a good life or, or professes Christ, they may not be on the right path. You know, that it does give us joy. We should have that joy that explodes like Jack that just it's gonna explode out of his chest. And we've got every reason to. We should be joyful. But those out there in the world that don't know Christ, they have no idea. They don't know what they're missing. And there, by the grace of God, there we are. At this. Amen. John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Has is a present uh, possession. Here is my fingernail clipper. And I have it. Those who have it, receive it. And they have it. That don't mean that he's going to drop it and, and he's going to, if you move your hand, he's going to move it over here. They ha it's a present possession. However, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That kind of blew the uh, prosperity, health, and wealth, and joy, and happiness. And the joy, of course, is different. But for people that, that uh, <coughs> preach the gospel, I heard it this morning, another guy, they're having their camp meetings. You know what those camp meetings are? They're trying to bilk money out of people. You know, seeds of faith. God's going to do this. He's going to pour out His favor. That is a false... That's a demonic gospel. Remember, Satan's got his own uh, ministers of life. He's got his own pastors. He's got his own churches. But don't believe it. How about another way? They will destroy relationships. If Satan can build a wedge between, between Jack and you, or between Rich and me, He's going to do it. He's, he's wanting to divide. Now, a healthy, we're the body of Christ. We're all part, all members, many members, one body. If he can sever the hand, then we can't be as functional. If we sever the foot, we're not going to be able to take the gospel into all areas. We need all of you. I need you. Amen. We need one another. Yeah. And he's going to try to put a division, drive a wedge between us so that our testimony and our effectiveness with the body of Christ is thwarted. Jesus said in Matthew 25, what, 41, he says, whatever you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Okay? That, that's the idea of our prison ministry, our outreach, our nursing, our, whatever else we do. And maybe even just like, like Tom has relationships that he has men that he works with. Probably the only way he can reach them is through Tom because he knows them. He know, he's, he's been with them. He's, they're familiar with them. Uh, those one-on-one -on -one relationships are, are one way to do that. But he's going to try to discourage us. So he's going to destroy marriages because that's the foundation of the nation. You know, if you took a, built a nation and you don't have the families as the foundation, it's going to be all sand. It's going to come in in a big wave and tsunami and it's all gone. By the way, every relationship and every marriage uh, marriage is a miracle because we're two people that are different from each other can exist. I mean, that's pretty much a miracle right there. I don't know that my, I don't know how my wife puts up with me. You know, I'm not worried about how I put up with her because I, I love her and it, she can do a lot of things and it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. But it could start over the tiniest little thing. One couple actually divorced because they were, they, I, I don't even know how to mention it. It was so ridiculous, a minor thing that they ended up divorcing. And it was something like you were, you, you know, you're using the right side of the bed and I'm using the left side and I want to switch over and st stupid stuff. Okay. Ephesians 6.12. That couple, I believe, is under spiritual attack. Though we walk in the flesh, that's me. <laughs> We are not waging war according to the flesh. We might think it, it might look that way, it might feel that way. Oh no, because our enemy is invisible. Mm -hmm. He, I can't see him, but I know he's there, and they are there. 
So remember to just be patient with one another, forgiving others' faults. Yes. Uh, overlook some things of others because he's going to try to make a little thing while he sips his coffee and it's like slurping his soup and I drive me crazy. That, I think that was it. That's what they divorced over. I think that's because I, I couldn't remember. A simple thing like that, the enemy got in and created a wedge and, and caused a divorce. Over something like that because tempers flared. Well, you did this and then, then that. And they started adding to other stuff. Well, you know, you put the toothbrush over here and you don't put the cap on the toothpaste. And you know, I, I laid the roll of toilet paper on the out and you love it out. This is driving me crazy. I can't understand that. That is an enemy attacking within. And if he can destroy the marriage of the family, he's going to destroy the nation. Yeah. So when the enemy can get us off our knees, that's a sign right there. Times of prayerlessness. When you have a weak prayer life, and a pre some of the worst times, when I was praying the other night, I was praying about this, and I was going to work on the message, and at the 11th hour, I said, no, I'm going to change everything. And there I go again. <laughs> Don't recommend doing that, by the way. And so I was up till like late last night because I it just laid on my heart that I think maybe this is this is what we need to hear. And I know the people in Korea and the Philippines and other elsewhere, uh, Iran, India, Pakistan, wherever they're listening, they're, they got it worse than we perhaps we did because they have they have no really civil rights like we do uh, for being persecuted. And uh, they can look at you the wrong way or, or think. Somebody's touching his head and they thought he was genuflecting and they killed him. That's what happens. You don't think about that because we live in personal safety here. But it's coming here too. It is coming. Yep. Prepare to be persecuted. To prepare to maybe lose jobs or whatever. It's coming. 2 Corinthians 10.3 Though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war against the flesh. In Ephesians 6.12 it says, All right, all right enemy is invisible. It's kind of hard to, to find an enemy that's invisible. And plus, by the way, he's got much more on you. But the thing is, we have the intercession of Christ. And if, if he gets us off our knees, we are cutting off the only source that we have from resisting spiritual attacks. There are times when it seems the most hard. Here's, here's an idea. I like the idea with children. When children are the most unlovable, obnoxious, just you, you know, you want to throw them outside and go out there playing the highway kind of deal. It's the very time that they let, need love the most. Yep. I know that sounds weird. Sometimes they do it because they need love. Disobedience sometimes is, look at me, I'm hurting. I had one person that was hurting so bad that was attacking other Christians, and I said, you know what, pray for this guy because he's probably something inside is hurting. Because when you lash out like a wounded animal, there's something going on inside. And I think he's under spiritual attack because he mentioned a couple of things to me, that I thought, wow. Uh, when I remember a pastor, we were preparing a sermon on this to preach. That same week, his dishwasher went out. His kid, uh, his child broke their leg in a soccer game. He almost got in a fight with the coach. Uh, a couple of five, six, seven things happened. All of my bam, 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 bam. Because I don't think he, Satan and the demons don't want you to know they exist. If they don't think you, they exist, we don't know they exist, they're a lot more dangerous, and we don't have to worry about them. But they're there. That's when they're most dangerous. It's when they're camouflaged also through other Christians. And I hate to say that. <clears throat> Remember Peter? You know, get behind me, Satan. That doesn't mean Peter was possessed. But he was influenced. Uh, and, and who knows uh, how, how that it can influence us. So uh, a couple other things I'll mention here because it's, it's, uh, it's important. That when we began to uh, care more for ourselves and our relationships are became more for ourselves, and we're going to say, I don't have a pen, but if we, okay, here's 50-50. I'm drawing a line down the middle. You do this much and I'll do this much. Relationships have never, that doesn't work in my home. No. That, that, it is not 50-50. It's not, I'll do this and you do this. It's, this it's, it's a matter of giving and extending and serving and loving, uh, emptying the litter box, taking out the trash. I mean, not, even little stuff like that. Yep. That, that's not ever, no relationship is ever 50-50 because if you ever think, well, he went to 51 and he's now I'm to my 50 and I'm down to 49, that hacks me off. See how we can't draw lines in the sand yeah. because that's going to cause divisions within members in the body of Christ and it's going to make us opposed to one another. Yes. And there should be no line there. Just cover your foot up in the sand and cover that line up. 
That's a Satanistic, demonistic way to divide church and, and weaken the body. So, you know, it's like if you see it, a hand is a beautiful thing and a marvelous thing. In fact, the, uh, MIT, the engineers there said it's one of the most amazing mechanical devices. And now they're doing mechanical arms according to the structure. God knew what he was doing. Now, if I take this hand and cut it off and it's lying on the street and somebody walks in, oh, it's grotesque. It's hideous. Nobody wants to see a hand. As, oh, this is sick. That's the point. If we're not attached to the body, we're dying and decaying and, and leaving, and, and we've lost the function. I've never seen a hand move or crawl. I mean, what is that one, a horror show? I guess they, I they see the hand moving, but that's not, the, that's not that's fiction. So we must not cause divisions because if somebody, for example, came in and we, and we divided over tongues or whatever, they had, whatever it might be, that's a big issue. That's a big one. They're, then they're going to go marching out the door and what, what do you, oh, they don't believe in tongues. What? But, but do they even believe in the Son of God? Yes. Do they believe in the sinless of Christ? Do they believe in the redemption of sinners? That's what, if they leave over that, then they're good, they're, they're gone. We have one guy that says, I'm not a sinner, and so, you know what, he didn't belong here then, because we're full of sinners here. Yep. You know? yep. And yep. I know I probably offended him, I think he talked to our elder about that, and he was offended, but you know what? I'm not glad that he was offended, but I'm, but I'm glad that it, it afflicted him somewhat and bothered him somewhat uh, because, you know, if there was, if he felt like he was okay and he was not, had arrived and he'd already reached perfection because he didn't, he was not a sinner anymore, I said, you know, you should be with the Lord then. You should not be here because this is a hospital for sick sinners yeah. who are being perfected or becoming perfected, more like Christ in the image. We're created in the image of God. So anybody that comes in that looks different, smells different, you know, they drive a different car, you know, we have to remember they're, they've got the same blood. It's not about race. It's about grace. Yes. And God looks at the heart. I'm not going to look at the outside. Uh, we'll have some guys that are maybe homeless, some guys that are perfect. They're going to come out jobless. They're going to be former comics. They're going to be, you know, it says, we're going to get along just great because we're a bunch of train wrecks here too. Yeah. So there's no reason for you to feel inferior. And what about my past? I says, yeah, I've got a past too, but I'm looking ahead. I'm looking forward. So he's going to want you to look back. He's going to want you to look at others' past and say, well, you know, he always and always and never. Anytime you say always and never, usually it's not right. Okay. Nobody always and nobody never. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to just keep in mind that because he's going to, He's going to cause us to nitpick over little tiny things that, that don't matter in eternity. Uh, so in relationships, when we start to keep count of things that we've done or they've done, the devil's got a foothold. He's got a foothold, or the Satan or one of the demons has got a foothold in the door. Because we can feel short change and then resent, well, how dare they? I can't believe he or she or fill in the blank, whoever it might be. And they're not keep, they're keeping track. That's not good. God's book of life. Your name is in it. He ain't gonna erase her. He's not gonna say, oh no, wait a minute, stay away, wait, wait, wait. So that person is made in the image of God. And they should be treated with that way. So uh, let me conclude by this: that most Christians realize, I hope we realize we've got a bullseye on our back. Uh -huh. And we're gonna have fiery darts coming your way. And and the enemy and the demons are going to try to destroy us. And uh, these, uh, really, we're not fighting against uh, something that we can see. We're fighting against something that we can't see. And it's going to try to destroy our relationship. It's going to try to drive a wedge between us. And it's going to be very much unchristlike because Romans 5, 6. For at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And I, I'm thinking that you do. But he died for us while we were still enemies and wicked sinners. Romans 5, 6 through 10 is the gospel, kind of, because he died for those who didn't deserve it. So, you know, he's going to try to thwart that, and he's going to try to destroy our testimony, and he's going to try to destroy our fellowship and destroy our union, because if he can do that, he's got a foothold in there. And when someone comes in, we've lost our testimony because of that. And I don't want that to happen because we need to be all one mind, one purpose, and one, one focus. And it is on being more Christ-like. And if you do, I guarantee you, it's coming. And the next week, I will talk a little bit, and I'll conclude with this. 
about what are signs, what, what are indications that you know for sure, yeah, this is spiritual doubt, or this is just my flesh. There's a way to tell, and it took me a while to find out, and I'm still learning, so I may come back learning something else. So be ready for spiritual warfare, for it's coming or it's already been here, and sometimes he will use other Christians to do that. And we use the sword, of, the word, the sword against other Christians as if we're sword fighting with them. Shame on us. That is not what the word of God teaches. Thank you very much. Father God, there is none of us worthy to receive your precious son in place of our life. Would the wrath of God abide on us that Christ came to remove that wrath that we so rightfully deserve. Yes. Father, help us to recognize when the enemy is trying to entrench itself within the church and within our hearts that cause us to divide among us and, and to create friction and uh, anything that unifies us. We know that it, time may be near and the spiritual attacks are going to increase. But God, we know that we need to armor up and turn to the book of Ephesians in chapter 6 and put on that full armor every day because we can't wrestle against flesh and blood. I mean, we can wrestle there, but we cannot wrestle against spirits in high places. We are at your mercy, and we ask your intervention. And thank you for these believers today. And I do thank God, literally, for everyone here. And glory of God, Jesus Christ, holy name, is who I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.